We're in a series, I already, we already, I already said it, called The Blessed Life. And The Blessed Life is this idea where we always have taken, since the beginning of our church, one month, four weeks out of 52 weeks, to always talk about this idea of generosity, to always talk about this idea of giving, to really understand what is our responsibilities, our responsibility is claiming to be followers of Jesus and this whole idea of generosity. And the reason why we do that is because we talked about it last week, because Jesus did it. Jesus talked more about generosity. He talked more about giving. Jesus talked more about your possessions than, ready, five times more than he did about love. More than about prayer, more than heaven, and more than hell. This idea was central to Jesus' teaching. 16 out of the 38 parables that Jesus taught was all around this idea. And so it's been very strategic. It's very important for us just to take a pause because our natural gravitational pull, listen, is for us. Even though, listen, we're generous and God just redeemed us and saved us, it's our natural pull to all tend to live a selfish life. And so we've always, always done this. And I had somebody say last week after the message, when I kicked off part one, they're like, Pastor Josh, I just happened to bring a friend that Sunday. So thanks for that one. Um, and uh, if you are, again, if you're, if you're new here or maybe you're visiting or maybe you're the one that's like, Pastor, please don't do this. I've really brought a friend. You're elbowing them saying he's really not like this normally. Normally it's so much funner. If you're here listening, guess what? I think you picked a great Sunday to come in church. I think you made an amazing decision. If you're new here and you're like, wait a second, but I'm new, I don't really, re listen, I think it's awesome to know even if you're visiting, that you're visiting a church that not only lives out its values, but it's determined to do everything it can to populate heaven and plunder hell in Jesus' name, to meet every single need, to be a part, listen, of a body of believers that wants to be the solution to the city's needs, not the problem. To have the government and council calling God's house, the church, the hope of the world and saying, we're in this crisis, we have this, how can, can the church help? And to be able to have everything that we need to be able to meet every single need represented in this city. That's why we talk about it. And that's what this church is all about. And so we, we kicked it off last week and taking a little bit of time because I really want you to understand the heart behind uh, this because we're going to do something a little bit different uh, today. I, can, I made you a promise last week that I'm going to retell you today. I promise you the reason why this is so important is because your enemy, the adversary, Satan, does not want you hearing a series of messages on this. He doesn't want it. And the reason why he doesn't is because he knows, listen, if we ever understood the godly principles as it pertains to godly stewardship and managing our finances, he knows if we ever put them into practice and actually live them out, listen, they would change your entire life. Not just not just your area of your finances, they would change your marriage, they would change your relationships, they would change the, your perspective on your career, your future, how you parent. It would literally change every aspect of your life and not just impact you, it would impact the local church. And the church would be able to accomplish the mission that Jesus put it on here on the earth to accomplish. And so there's lots of things, lots of reasons why we have to talk about this. And so I'm, I'm just excited that you're here. And I said we we're going to do something a little bit different today. Let me tell you very quickly, uh, the Blessed Life series, the content even, the messaging, everything behind it is not original. It's not from me. Um, it actually comes from a father figure uh, in the faith by the name of Pastor Robert Morse. He's the senior pastor of Gateway Church. He founded it in 2000. It's in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and just in the short time, that church is well over 35,000 people in the Dallas Fort Worth area. It has multiple locations, literally changing uh, not just the world, changing America, changing city. It's it, They're making a tremendous, tremendous impact. He's, he's a renowned author, written over 14 books. And when Crystal and I first got married, um, we, we made some newlywed mistakes in, in the area of our finances. I know I can see all your faces. You guys are way too holy. You never did that. But when Chris and I first got married, we thought that we could afford everything. And we thought if it, if it got approved on credit, that means we could buy it. And so we made some very, very strategic uh, decisions that weren't very strategic at all. Uh, and we ended up paying the price for that. And I remember being um, we'd always believed in giving. We were always tithing. We were always, but there were some principles about giving and about stewardship and understanding that we don't own anything, that we're just managers of what God's given us. And when I begin to realize that and we begin to put some of these principles uh, that you're being taught through this series, I'm telling you, I'm as a witness on this stage. I don't have to, it, they literally changed our life. They literally transformed how we spent. They transformed how we thought. Listen, and we really entered into a realm of living a blessed life in every single area of our life. And the, the blessed life is, is it's sold millions and millions of copies. It's from a book. And Pastor Robert has a six-week message series 
Uh, this is his life's message. He's been teaching uh, this message for over 30 years. And I, I thought it would be important with everything that we're doing in the life of our church. Uh, and I, I kicked off, like I said, last week and writing at the movies and doing all these things. Uh, he's been preaching this for 30 years. And honestly, he can preach, preach it a whole lot better than I could ever preach it, ever. Uh, and it's his life story. And so we've, I've been learning from these principles. You need to hear me say, as your pastor, these principles have transformed my life. They're transforming our life still. Today, we're still applying them. We're still using them. And, and so he teaches this principle called the principle of the first. And uh, when we were, the team was watching, we sent it out and the team's watching this. The team is practicing this. We're making adjustments. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, we have to show that to our people. We have to show uh, this message uh, to the church. And so uh, we're going to do that today. We've, if, if you're like, we're going to do what? We don't ever, ever, ever do this, but we still believe, and you maybe think it's weird, we just still believe that God can teach you through a video. Some of you are like, oh, amen. No. You, 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 God uses technology, and you just be okay with this is how, this, God, God can speak. Uh, and I tell you, as I was watching this, and I've watched it about 15 times, because uh, we knew we were going to show this to you, this, this message, this series of messages really changed my, changed my life. Again, I want to encourage you to buy this book, The Blessed Life. Uh, we're actually looking at trying to have some copies hopefully next week at our connections for you to purchase. But he's written over 14 books. This movie, I mean this movie, this this book, The Blessed Life, I promise you will change uh, your life. And so I got to warn you from the beginning, he's a father figure. Um, he's Like I said, he's been doing this for 35 years. He's not a, I've been doing this for four years. He's been doing this for 35 years. One of our, our pastors says faithfulness is not measured in days. It's measured in decades. You know, it's easy to be faithful for a few. It's different to be faithful for the long haul. And so uh, he's been doing this for such a long time. And I just got to warn you, because he's a father figure, um, like my dad, he comes off, he's going to come across a little strong. Okay? And by the way, I think strong is okay. Sometimes we need strong. Sometimes we need a full, uh, balanced diet. We can't just eat dessert every single time we want to come to church. Sometimes you got to go eat your collard greens. Well, this morning, you're going to get some collard greens in the Word. I promise you that. And um, he's going to get right to work. He doesn't have time to do He dis dispenses with the pleasantries. And he's going to get to work right in Exodus chapter 13. And I believe that God's going to speak to you. And like, again, he, I know that he's spoken to me. But I want you, listen, to lean in. This is not at the movies. This is not soda and popcorn. This is God's word directly being transferred to your heart. Open up your heart. Engage your mind. Be thinking person, a follower of Jesus, and just ask God, Lord, what are you speaking to me today? And allow God to transform your heart. And then I'm going to come back up at the end. You guys okay? You guys ready? Come on. Jesus is on the throne still. So we love you, and I want you to lean in. Let's, we're going to keep the lights up. They're going to stay like this the whole entire time, guys. And uh, we're going to take notes. And so I want you to lean in, and here's a message. I promise you that will change your life from Pastor Robert Morris. Let's take a look. Hey, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. And I want to encourage you to open your heart to the Holy Spirit right now. You're not just going to hear knowledge or good information. We are believing for inspiration and revelation from God's Word to you specifically. So listen and ask yourself during this time, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? I want you to turn your Bibles to one passage of scripture. We'll go through some others, but we'll just look at one, Exodus 13. We'll just go to one, uh, Exodus chapter 13. And uh, as you're getting to Exodus 13, let me just say this. This is, in my opinion, the most important message in the series. We're in a, the series called The Blessed Life, and this is probably the most important message in the series. The title of this message is The Principle of First. The Principle of First. And I want to make this statement. If God is first in your life, then everything will come into order. Now, I'm not saying you won't have difficulties or problems or go through struggles. Jesus said in this world you'll have tribulation. But would you rather go through tribulation with everything in order <laughs> or everything out of order? And hear me, if Jesus is first, if God's first, everything will come into order in your life. If he is not first, then nothing will come into order in your life. God has to be first for there to be order in your life. So I want to show you this principle because this principle 
is a principle that runs all through Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Here, so let's start Exodus chapter 13. Look at verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. It is mine. It belongs to me. I wish that I could adequately explain to you how emphatic the language is in the Hebrew here, this phrase, it is mine. It is my property. It belongs to me. I'm the owner. It's extremely emphatic. It's very important to understand that when we talk about the principle of first. The firstborn, he says, belongs to me. Okay, now look at verse 12. That you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. Very similar language in the Hebrew, shall belong to God. They'll be the Lord's. But every firstborn, now we'll talk about this, of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Very important. A donkey will be redeemed with a lamb. Now watch this phrase, and if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. It's very important to understand that if you don't redeem it, you're going to lose it anyway. And I want you to apply that as we talk about the first of our finances, the first 10%. He says, you're, if, you don't, if you don't bring it to me, you're going to lose it. You're still going to lose it. It's going out of your account. Watch this. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. All right, so I have three points. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, that's a longer point than I normally have, and so we'll make sure and leave it up long enough for you to be able to, to write it down. The firstborn must be. There, there, there is, there, the, the, I, 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 I've prayed over this language before, uh, whether I should say it this way. But according to Scripture, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. That's the principle here in the Old Testament that is referring to a principle that goes all through the Bible. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Okay, but how do you know which to do? How do you know whether you sacrifice it or redeem it? Well, he gives two animals which are exemplary of categories of animals. He, he, he gives us the donkey and the lamb, okay? The donkey represents unclean animals, and the lamb represents clean animals. So how do you know which to do? Well, if it's a clean animal, it has to be sacrificed, the firstborn. If it's an unclean animal, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Let me say that one more time. If it's clean firstborn, I'm hoping you kind of get ahead of me on this and understand what this represents. If it's a clean and it's firstborn, it has to be sacrificed. If it's unclean, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Okay, well, how in the world does this relate to us today? Well, let me ask you two, two questions, all right? First of all, were you and I spiritually born clean or unclean? In other words, when we were born in the natural, our spiritual state before God, were we born into this world, were we clean or unclean? unclean. We were all born in sin, right? I can prove it by simply asking the experts here, the parents, did you have to teach your children to be bad? <laughs> or did that come naturally for them? See, we have to teach them to be good. Is that right? Because we're all born with a sin nature. That's, that's what the Bible says, all right? So, we were all born unclean. Was Jesus born unclean or clean? Clean. Okay, listen to me. Listen very carefully. The clean, Jesus, the clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. That's what we just read. <laughs> That's how important this principle is. And we're going to see that this principle refers to tithing, but I want to say something to you that maybe you've never thought of. Jesus is God's tithe. 
Because you see, you give the tithe first. You don't pay your bills and see if you have enough left over to tithe. You give the tithe first. It's the first 10%. It's not just 10%. It's the first 10% because it takes faith to give the first. See, God said, when your sheep has a lamb, give me the first one. It takes faith to give the first one before you have any more. You don't know if the sheep's going to produce anymore. That takes faith. God didn't say, wait until your sheep has 10 and then give me one of them and you can give me the one that keeps getting in your garden that you don't like. <laughs> no, he said, you give me the first one before you have any others. See, so many people think it's not the 10% that enacts the blessing, it's the faith that enacts the blessing. It's giving the first 10%. And the reason I say that Jesus is God's tithe is because God gave Jesus first. He didn't wait to see if we would clean up or straighten up to give his son. God gave Jesus when we were mocking him and spitting on him and nailing him to a cross. Romans says it this way, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans also said this way, that God gave Jesus in hope. In hope. And that word, the root of that word is faith. In faith, we give our tithe in faith. So it's the first 10%. Think about this. When the children of Israel went into the, the uh, promised land, God said, bring all of the silver and gold from Jericho into the house of God. It's always into the house of God. That's always where the tithe goes. But why didn't he say 10% of Jericho? Hey, it's very simple. Because Jericho was the first city. That's simple. He said, bring the first into the house of the Lord and the rest are redeemed. They're out from under the curse. They're blessed. See, the first portion has the redemptive, is the redemptive portion. The, please hear me. When you give the first to God, the rest are redeemed. That's what this is saying. So, hear me clearly. <laughs> Don't give the first portion to the mortgage company because the mortgage company does not have the power to bless your finances. But God does. The first portion, first 10% goes to God. So the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Here's the second point. The first fruits must be offered. Again, I want to just key in on these words, must be. According to this principle that works all through Scripture, the first fruits must be offered. You can stay there in Exodus 13. Look at Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Bonuses, everything. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Okay, this says to honor the Lord with the first of our increase. I just want to just make a note here. This is in Proverbs. This is not the law. This is not under the law. This is hundreds of years after the law. This is a principle that runs all through Scripture. Let me show you another Scripture, Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits. I kind of like that phrase because it's like God is saying, listen closely if you don't know what first means. The first of your first fruits, of the first fruits of your land. Now watch these words. You shall bring, that's an important word, bring, into the house of the Lord your God. Now we, we saw last weekend about Malachi, he said, bring the tithes into the storehouse. The tithe always comes to the, to the church. You, don't, you can't divide your tithe. You can't designate your tithe. You can't give it somewhere else. But I want you to notice the word bring. The reason God uses the word bring instead of the word give when he talks about tithing is because you can't give what doesn't belong to you. You have two choices according to Scripture. And I know this is strong, but I've studied this for over 30 years now. You have two choices when it comes to the tithe according to Scripture. You can bring it or you can steal it. Those are the only two choices. There's no other choice according to Scripture. They either brought it or they stole it. Remember when God said, bring all the silver and gold from Jericho, that Achan kept some. And of course, the next city, then they lost the battle until they brought it to the house of God. But here was the point. In, in Joshua chapter 6, God calls the tithe consecrated or set apart. Same thing he called the firstborn. But in Joshua 7, once Achan took it, he said, Israel has stolen 
from me, and they're cursed. They're cursed. It's consecrated when you bring it to the house of God. It's cursed if you leave it in your bank account. Here's a real simple, straightforward question. Why would you want something cursed in your bank account? I mean, it has enough problems. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want your bank account blessed? See, it takes faith to give the first. It takes faith to believe that 90% redeemed and blessed will go farther than 100% cursed. It takes faith. So you give the first. Um, uh, when I was in college, one of the uh, students asked one of the professors, why did God accept Abel's offering and he didn't accept Cain's? And the professor said, you know, I, I really don't know. And for some reason, I've always remembered that, but when the Lord showed me this principle of firstborn and firstfruits, it's, you actually will see why God accepted Abel's and he didn't accept Cain's. Well, watch Genesis 4, verses 3 through 5. And in the process of time, now those words are very important. In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Notice it specifically does not say that he brought first fruits. He just brought an offering in the process of time. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected, or this word could be received, Abel and his offering. Notice the persons received too, not just the offering. But he did not respect or receive Cain and his offering. It's, it's simple, isn't it? Cain was a farmer. He didn't bring first fruits. Abel was a rancher. He brought firstborn. God said, I'll accept that. I will not accept that. Then accept it. Now, I'm going to take you a little farther in this, and that is that it's not just that God wouldn't accept it. It's that God couldn't accept it. There are some things God can't do. God can't act outside of himself. He can't act outside of his character. One of the greatest studies you could ever do would be the attributes of God, to know who God really is. Okay, so let me, let me tell you a, a few things that God can't do. Uh, number one, God can't change. He can't change. This is called the immutability. This would be the doctrinal theological word, the immutability of God. It's impossible for God to change. The reason God can't change is because if God could change, he could get better, and God can't get better because he's perfect. So God can't change. Uh, the second thing God can't do, I'll just give you, give you some examples, is that God can't think the way we think. Now, I'll clarify that because we know the Bible talks about the thoughts of God, but that actually proves this theology. God can't think the way we think. Let me just, just uh, help us with this. Um, we, the reason God can't think the way we think is because this is, here's the theological word, omniscient. Omniscience, the omniscience of God. Break it down, it's two words, omni-science. Science means knowledge, omni means all. God has all knowledge. So the reason God can't think the way we think is because we think to figure things out. God's not trying to figure anything out. Let, let me say it another way when we're talking about God's thoughts. Nothing has ever occurred to God. God has never said, you know what I just thought of? I just thought of something I've never thought of before. He's never said that. You know why? Because he knows everything at the same time. Hey, I have a, a new little thought on this. Uh, when we talk about that God, nothing's ever occurred to God, let me, let me say it another way. God has never heard something and said, oh, my self. I mean, he wouldn't say, oh, my God. He'd say, oh, my. Okay, all right, so. <clears throat> So God, God can't think the way we think. Now, when I said God can't think, you might have remembered a scripture and thought, wait, there's a scripture that talks about, uh-huh, that proves this. Here's what the scripture says in Isaiah. My thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't think the way you think. As the heavens are above the earth, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. I don't think the way you think. That's what he's saying. Okay, so there's some things God can't do. Let me tell you how this relates to this. God can't be second. 
He can't be second. This is called the preeminence of God. You know, you've heard of eminence, but God is preeminent. That means he's not only first of all, he's before all. He's higher than all. He's above all. He's first. He's before all. So God is first. Now, we, we, in our lives, we talk about putting God first, and that's good because we do need to put God first in our lives. But I just want you to know something. Even if God's not first in your life, he's still first. You didn't rearrange his order in the universe. He's still preeminent. So, God can never be second. So, this is why I'm telling you, the reason God couldn't accept Cain's offering is because God's always first, and Cain did not bring a first offering. And God said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't accept a second place offering because I'm always in first place. I can't accept it. Now, we need to think about that when it comes to the tithe. You remember uh, I said Jesus is God's tithe? And I said to you last weekend, because we talked about giving to, to the bride of Christ, and I said that tithing is probably more personal to Jesus than what we think. Okay, I want you to think about this. If Jesus is God's tithe, Tithing might be a little more personal to the Father also than what we think. See, it represents who's first in your life. You, you can, and I'm, again, I know these, some of the things I'm saying are strong, but you can tell me all day God's first in your life, but let me see your bank account. And I'll tell you who's first. It, it might be Nordstrom's. Okay, ladies, let me hit the guys. It might be Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> Where does the first 10% go? That's who's first. All right, so the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. The first fruits must be offered. Here's point three. The tithe must be first. The tithe must be first. Leviticus 27, 30 says, and all, I want you to notice the word all, and all the tithe of the land, all of it, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. There's the emphatic phrase again, belongs to God. It is, it, God set it apart for himself. And that's what the next phrase says. It is holy. That word holy is the word that simply means set apart. It is set apart to the Lord. That's why it's stealing, because he set it apart to himself. And that's why it has to be first, because God's first and he owns it. So in, order, in other words, if we're going to return it, we have to return it first. Okay, so I'm going I'm to give you an illustration, um, and it's a math illustration, okay? So I'm warning you, so half of you can take a nap, all right? Um, let's say that you're a landscaper, and you uh, come to our home, and Pastor Albert, um, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I call you, and I say, listen, uh, I'd like to add some trees and some plants and some… Okay, let me make this uh, illustration realistic. Debbie would like to add some plants and some trees and some flowers and things, you know. And so you give me an estimate. You say, now, this is how much my materials will be. This is how much my labor it will be. And my profit will be $1,000. You need to know you, the tithe is on the profit. It's not on all of this. It's on the increase, your personal increase, personal income. That's what we tithe on, okay? So, um, so you say, are you agreeable to this whole price? I say, yes, I am. So after you do the job, I pay for all your materials, all your labors. And then for your profit, let's say that I give you 10 $100 bills. So you have $1,000 in your hand, okay? So this is the math part, right? So you have $1,000. Let me ask you two questions, all right? $1,000, the word tithe, remember, means 10%. So how much is the tithe? $100, all right? I know some of you still okay, carry the, okay. But that's all right. That's okay. All right, so it's $100, that's right. But you have 10 $100 bills in your hand, so which one is the tithe? The first one, yeah, okay. The one on top, someone said, all right, let me say it to you a different way, all right? It's the first one that leaves your hand. That's the tithe. In other words, if you go home and you say, let me set aside some for the mortgage, some for the car, some for utility, some for clothes, and here's God's part. No, that's not God's part. You gave God's part to the mortgage company. Because here's what a lot of people do. Okay, let me set aside some for this and this and this, and oh, there's not enough left over for God. Can I say something nicely to you, but firmly? He wouldn't accept it anyway, because our God does not accept leftovers. Matter of fact, he says it in Malachi. He says, you bring me the blind and the, and the lame animals, and I do not accept them. I accept the first. 
That's all I accept. Okay, so how, how does this work out in my own life? I get paid on the 15th and 30th, and, uh, or the last day of the month, 30th or 31st, and it's directly deposited. So it's like it magically appears, you know, in my account. So what I do on the 15th and the last day of the month is while I'm having my quiet time in the morning, before I do anything else, I go online, and, and that's the way now. I think it's just easiest to give online. I go online, and I uh, send the tithe to Gateway Church. So what happens, though, if I, I, I have an early morning meeting, and um, I kind of rush out. I don't have my quiet time that day. And I get home that night, and I think, oh, it's the 15th. I forgot to do the tithe. And I go in, and I notice that Debbie has been to the grocery store that day. Okay, what I do? I don't say, oh, it's great, sugar. We're cursed. <laughs> it's great. I mean, you gave the tithe to Kroger's, and so we're cursed now. No, because I'm not legalistic about it. And listen to me, God's not legalistic either. I'm not trying to give you a legalistic principle today. I'm trying to give you a principle that's about your heart. Where's your heart? God knows my heart, and He knows your heart. Where's your heart? So the first 10% goes to the house of God. Now, Exodus 13, let me show you one more scripture, and, and then we're finished, all right? We stopped a while ago at verse 13, so let's pick it up at verse 14. So it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, what is this? Okay, in other words, he's saying one day your son's going to ask you, why are you killing these animals? That you shall say to him, by strength of hand, by a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Okay, I want you to, let's just bring this up to modern day. Let's think about this. The son uh, goes away to college. He gets his degree. He comes back. His dad says, hey, one of the things I like you to do is take over the books. And so one day the son is sitting in there, and he's got the books in front of him. Dad comes in from the field, and the son says, uh, Dad, um, uh, sit, sit down, Dad. Uh, you know, you asked me to, you know, take over the books and uh, the business and all. And, Dad, I'm, 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 I've been going over the books, and... Um, Dad, um, I, want, I want to talk to you about something, man. Um, you might not even know you do this. You know, Dad? Uh, we all have blind spots, you know? So, not accusing you, just, just talking numbers now. Um, but, Dad, um, e every time uh, one of our animals has a, a firstborn, you, um, how shall I say this, uh, kill it. And, uh, Dad, uh, I think it's getting out of hand uh, with you because you, you, you killed 72 animals last year. And um, um, we're, we're in the ranching business, Dad. And uh, th th this is cutting into our profits. So wh wh why do you do that? He said, one day your son's going to ask you. And he said, when he asks you, you say to your son, son, um, I need to tell you something about our family that you don't know. But we weren't always in the ranching business. We, we did not own animals. We didn't own land. Son, we were slaves. We were in bondage. But God, with a mighty hand, redeemed us and gave us everything we have now. Therefore, we gladly give to God the firstborn of all of our increase. Now, this was written 4,000 years ago. And this principle happened to me. Uh, when Josh was kind of getting old enough to understand numbers and all, and he has this mathematical mind like I do and like his grandfather. And so one day I was paying the bills. Now, we didn't have online back then. And so what I would do is I would write the check first. 
and then I would set the check, the tithe check, and then I would settle over the side, and then I would pay the bills. But I'd always write the tithe check first and set it over the side and then take it with me to church. By the way, for you young people, we used to have pieces of paper called checks. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I'd settle over the side. So I am paid the bills, and Josh came in, and I'm watching him out of the corner of my eye. And he's reading this tithe check, and he sees the amount which to a, a young boy looks like a lot of money. And he says, Dad, why are you giving so much to the church? And I remember this scripture, when your son asks you, this is what you tell him. And I took Josh and I actually set him on my lap and I said to him, I need to tell you something about daddy that you don't know. But daddy wasn't always a Christian, son. And daddy was a very bad man. And daddy was in bondage. But God with a mighty hand redeemed your daddy and gave us everything we have now. Therefore, I gladly give to God the first of all of my increase. This is a principle that's all through Scripture. It's called the principle of first. Is God first in your life? I want you to take a moment and just ask the Holy Spirit a question right now. I tell every member of Gateway Church to do this every week after the message, and it's very important because God not only speaks to us, He speaks to me, and He speaks to you. So just take a moment and ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? Right now, in your heart, you don't have to do this out loud, but right now, in your heart, just, just breathe that prayer. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me through this message? And then just take a moment to listen. And you know, He might answer you right now, and He might also take the rest of this week to expand His answer. So let the Holy Spirit take this message and direct it to you personally, and then let Him give you direction and the answer and the path going forward. I want to pray for you for a moment. Lord, thank you for what you spoke today. And I ask you, Lord, that you would cause this message to affect me and to affect every person who hears this message. In Jesus' name, amen. I, uh, I was thinking about that. I hope just we're going to be way ahead of time because I didn't preach this morning. Hello, we got lots of time left. But I want you to be still because I want to, I don't know about you, but that, I guess because my kids are so young and they're so curious now, all for Lucy, Josh, Lincoln, and Josie. And for some reason, when I, when I watched that message, that illustration, it, it, it messed with me. That one day my, my kids are going to ask me, a question why and when I watched that I, I, I couldn't help but think man I don't want the question that they ask to be you know dad why did you work so much or why did you travel so much or why did you do so much here why did you I just found myself just before the Lord saying Mike if there's a question God Lord, help me to live my life in such a way that, because not only God's noticing, but you're, come on, our legacy, people around you, let me live my life in such a way where people, Dad, why do you give like that? Why do you serve like that? Why do you help like that? Why do you live like that? Why do you go to church like that? Why, why, I'm telling you, it's impacting not only us, come on, this blessed life, we've said it, will not only change your life, but it'll change every life directly around you. I want you to bow your heads right now and just close your eyes. I'm, 
you just heard from Pastor Robert, but I know if even I, that's the 10th time I've watched it, I could just still sense God's still small voice speaking, directing. Let me ask you, what is God speaking to you? What is his presence saying to you? With your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want you to think about this one thought. You heard it a lot in that message. It was this, the word first. First. That Jesus was God's tithe to us and he sent him first. He sent the clean <laughs> to redeem and save what was unclean. And you need to know right now with your head bowed and your eyes closed that God, the very first thing that God wants isn't any of your stuff. Listen, he just wants you. That the one thing that God wants that he might not already have, listen, isn't anything, but it's your heart. It's you. It's the very first thing that you can give and bring to him. So Jesus, Lord, right now we just... We stop, Lord, every single one of us, Lord, and God, I know that there's people in the room right now, Lord, that you're not first in their life, or that maybe they have some of you, they have a, a part, but Lord, you're not, not all of you, Lord, you're not, you're not in your rightful place in our lives, and I thank you, Lord, that you don't require anything from us, Lord, first, you just want us, Lord, that you just came to save us, forgive us, restore us. So Jesus, every single one of us in the room today, God, we just, we come before you and we just say, Lord, forgive us. Come on, why don't you just say that right now? Can you just say Jesus? Come on, every single person, let's say it with faith. Or come on, say Jesus, forgive me. I want to put you first in my life. And I surrender everything to you today. So, Lord, we're so thankful, God. We thank you for your unconditional love, God. We thank you that even though we were slaves and we didn't deserve it, and God, we betrayed and we walked away, Lord, thank you that you didn't wait to see how we would respond, Lord, but you just sent your son, Jesus. So, Lord, this is the least we can do, Lord, is just give you our lives. Surrender our lives to you, Lord. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, Lord, you've saved us. And we are so thankful today, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We praise you. It's in the mighty, the awesome, the great name of Jesus Christ we pray. Come on, everybody, say it. Come on, really say it. Amen.